Welcome to the Daily Horror Habit Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Krieger, bringing you daily reviews of currently streaming horror movies for your twisted pleasure. Be aware that these reviews may include mild spoilers. And as always, I hope you enjoy. Today's review is of Duncan Jones' directorial debut, Moon, which is currently streaming on Showtime. Moon follows astronaut Sam Bell, played by Sam Rockwell, who's preparing to return to Earth after a three-year mining contract on the moon. But when a mysterious man suddenly appears, returning home might be more complicated than Sam thought. And joining me to excavate the secrets from the far side of the moon are returning friends of the show, Birdo and Max. What's going on, guys? What's happening? How's it going? Not too bad. I'm excited to talk about Moon today. This is a movie that, again, a movie I probably haven't watched since it was released. And mm. I'm interested to see how it held up for you guys. So, Max, you actually picked Moon. Uh, was this the first time you'd seen it, or was this a rewatch for you as well? It was a rewatch. Um, a buddy of mine from college suggested it, and I really enjoyed it. And then I think uh, we were going to, we talked about Europa Report, which and it was kind of slow and this is kind of i guess a similar concept um but a lot more going on or it, it just i don't know it, it sat better and it felt like a better play, uh pace and the twists were great as well yeah there's definitely a few more layers to it than um the kind of disaster heavy focus of europa report but berto you'd seen this as, as well before how did this hold up for you on a rewatch yeah i find it that I've been rewatching a bunch of movies and I find it the second times are much better. Like you really catch on to everything that happened and like, um, same, like I, I, the same thing I watched yesterday interstellar for like the second time it's a long movie, but like, again, I caught like you really catch little subtle hints that you don't really notice the first time. But yeah, this movie, I, yeah, I really liked the, the twist. You kind of catch early on what's going on and you kind of are aware of what's happening. And I, I enjoyed it definitely better the second time. Yeah. With movies like this, I think re- revisits and rewatches really accompany the idea that like, as soon as you know what the mystery is, you're not trying to figure out what the twist is. You can stop paying attention so much to like uncovering everything and just kind of like picking up on little details that you missed the first yeah. time. Um, and a movie like this, I mean, it's since it's so singular focused on one character for majority of the film or for like 99% of the film, it really helps that Duncan Jones has made this world that is very much kind of filled with a lot of details and small storytelling uh, things. But Max, what did you think of the film's kind of one man show approach with, I mean, Sam Rockwell is the only character in the movie, essentially. Uh, Did you think that having one protagonist helped or kind of hurt the overall narrative? I think it, it definitely helped um, because the narrative is him by himself on the moon. That's, I guess that's one of the, sources of conflict is that uh he, he's been on the moon by himself for three years um he has a little robot buddy but for the most part it's just him and so i think allow i think just having one person um allows you to focus on that person and really pick up on how you know his his mental state might deteriorate physically he might deteriorate and notice that change from when he's first introduced in the movie to um, the end of the movie, how, how the shift happened. What'd you think Berto about that? Kind of along the line with Max, like it's really cool to see how his mental aspect of a human being being by themselves in a world where there's no human life around, it really affects you. And uh, yeah, that was kind of the cool thing. Like Max said, it's like, you see the change throughout the whole movie of like how his mentally is he starts seeing things and then he like basically you can at the end he's physically torn up like he just like literally physically just can't hold on anymore and I I really like that the fact that it was basically just him on his own and trying to survive just for three years which is when the contract's up so he can go home and uh, yeah that's that's part of one of the coolest thing about having an individual character in a movie that you can kind of get more you it's okay to go into detail, I feel like, with the character because it's just one plot and one person. It doesn't get confusing compared to like if you had multiple characters. Yeah, I mean, it, it lends itself to being more of an introspective tale, right? It's more about like him looking at himself and his life and then he has the realization that I'm number six or seven of a bunch of clones of myself because that's kind of the big twist of the movie is that the mining contract ends after three years but the escape pod that's supposed to take him to earth is actually just an incinerator. And 
once they incinerate the current clone, then the contract ends supposedly. They just wake up another clone and they carry out the next three years and the next three years and the next three years. And so having him spend a majority of the film by himself and then have a clone of him show up and he starts playing off of himself, it's a really interesting dynamic because like we've all seen movies where there's just one character sometimes in a movie where it's a singular focus, but very rarely is it a character or an actor just playing off of themselves. And so the way that they were able to kind of just sequence that up, I thought was really interesting and in how like we see the dynamic between the new clone and the old clone change throughout the movie. Um, and for me, I mean, considering there aren't a lot of like big action set pieces in the movie or a lot of um, action in general, like the attention to focusing on that relationship, I thought was really interesting. What did you think of the relationship with the new clone and the old clone, Max? I thought it fit. Uh, I, you know, when I first watched it, I thought there was going to be a lot of conflict between the two. Now, and I, I think the timeline from when the, what was it, like 14 hours? Yeah, that, for the rescue. You know, they discovered each other. Yeah, until that, that rescue team was coming. And in that 14 hours, they... I think they came to terms with a lot of like really heavy concepts. You know, one, they found out they're clones. Uh, their life is a lie and one of them is going to die soon. So dealing with your own mortality, your own sense of self and existence in 14 hours is a lot. That's a, that's <laughs> so a heavy, like, that's yeah. a heavy span of uh, that's, 14 hours. That's a lot, you know, and, and, you know, it may have been, you know, being able to talk to yourself, literally talk to yourself, like help them, you know, through all these, these uh, major uh, thought processes and like sense of identity when you're literally staring at yourself, I, I guess. Um, but, you know, I, there was enough conflict that, um, you know, it, it seemed realistic, but then that resolution at the end, uh, I felt wrapped up pretty well. Berta, what did you think about the relationship? Did you think that it was a good pairing to kind of have him be like the the older one is the seasoned clone essentially, and then the new one is obviously fresh, like in terms of just like he was just birthed or woken up or whatever. But at the same time, even though he's like the newbie, he knows about everything that's going on. What did you think about that kind of dynamic between the clones? Yeah, I, I liked it. I feel like every clone, like the, the other clone that woke up, the second one was kind of like the old clone kind of updated him to what's going on, what happened, all the information he knows. And it's kind of like this clone is like keeps upgrading and evolves to a, a better, more humane kind of person instead of a clone. So I really liked that at the beginning, it was kind of like, what the hell are you? You're me and like, he was freaking out, but at the end, you figure out like they're kind of almost working together to get out of there and like to really go back to earth. And um, I really liked how they, their relationship kind of grew and, and it's just like basically trying to evolve each other. So their kind of clone species just keeps getting better and more knowledge. I guess that really helped them to get out of there. Um, but overall, I thought it was a great, great uh, bond that they had. Um, as far as the narrative, having, you know, using that implanted memory skips a lot of that filler scenes where, you know, what he has to figure out how to do all this stuff. If he just wakes up and he knows how to do everything, uh, I think that re that was very efficient in storytelling, um, especially since they explained it in the beginning of the movie and then they reiterated that fact as soon as um, the second clone woke up. Uh, so, yeah, I, I just wanted to point that out. I think it was a good um, directorial uh path he took yeah absolutely and i mean they do there isn't a lot of downtime i think the movie is like an hour and 35 minutes and some change maybe but there isn't a lot of downtime and it is very streamlined in terms of it is a simplistic story so it doesn't take a lot of time to establish the story and the parameters and the, obviously there's one character so that helps but the way that duncan jones like max said is able to kind of fill us in without ever bogging down the narrative like we kind of see him what his life is like, what his role is like. And then he's presented with this dilemma where he's like, I'm going home and all of a sudden there's a guy that looks just like me. Um, but to what Max had said a little bit earlier in terms of their relationship, I was glad that their relationship for a majority of the movie is not conflict. Like you have that brief struggle where 
they're f- wrestling over the knife and all of this. And it's mostly like out of fear because the, the old clone doesn't realize what's happening and moving away from that and having them kind of like work together for me, at least I thought that was like the much more interesting Avenue. Cause how many times do we watch movies where it's just like, there's like essentially instead of a moon, it's an Island and it's two people stranded on an Island and they're trying to get off. Like the two of them basically fight each other for survival. And I just find that them working together and then also with Gertie just makes for a more interesting narrative. Um, but what did you guys think of the reasoning behind the old clone, for lack of a better word, falling apart, like to what Berto said? Because we see throughout the course of the movie, the old clone starts breaking down. He starts vomiting up blood. His teeth are falling out. He looks like shit every other three or four minutes. Like his skin becomes very pale and gray. What did you guys think the reasoning was behind that? Because I have a theory, but I'm interested to see what you guys thought. I think I think the what, my theory is that like, so they have a three-year contract. They clone people just enough so the contract's up so they die before they ever think about going home. So I feel like to me, it's like they have them just basically trapped in the moon for them to work for them. But like just when they think the contract's up, like when they're going to get picked up, they kind of have sick, they get sick and they die and then bring the next guy over and it's kind of like redo. It's like a very repetitive process. I think that was that's my theory on that, which I think it, it worked out great. I also feel like the the way the story went is like, there's nothing really, there's no mystery to anything. Everything's kind of put out on the table. And I think that's what also helped uh, out the movie a lot to keep the flow going. Um, but yeah, the contract wise, I think that was probably, at first I had a question, like I thought about it. I was like, wait, why is he dying? But then you kind of start thinking about it. It's like, well, his three year contract's coming up and he's about to get picked up in like 14 hours or whatever. And he starts getting sick. He starts vomiting and like, I feel like that they it kind of like they cloned them just enough time for them to maximize their work and kill them off before they have to send them home. What do you think, Max? I think it's like a like a half life type of thing where you know they they found well it's like a half life type of thing and they the clone survives just long enough um, to the point of total insanity. I think um, I think you can't be by yourself for three years. Um, isolated like that so maybe when the original Sam uh, was up there they ran tests and experience and figured out that the, the longest someone can be by themselves cut off from the world is uh, three years and so you know through trial and error I, I, I think that the company was able to create you know figure out the timeline where the clone is developed you know to maturity implant the memories and by the, by that time the clone lives for about three years and then kind of falls apart. Yeah. So I had a, my idea behind it is like a combination of both of yours is that they're up there for three years because that was the amount of time that they could coexist in that environment because you have to think about all of the materials that they're mining and all of the equipment up there that's running and it's, an automated facility. So on some level, there's probably a lot of radiation on the moon that they've introduced. And the idea that, because if you look at his symptoms, like his body is literally like shutting down in a lot of ways and he's vomiting blood, he's losing teeth, he's losing hair, he's, his uh, skin is becoming gray and discolored and all these different things that look like symptoms of radiation poisoning. But I think it's, you could very easily make a case for my theory or either of your theories in that yeah, Sam, like Berto said, the original Sam realized that, hey, he did his three-year stint and there were some negative side effects. And so they realized like, just because you clone somebody, if they're going to be by themselves, they're still going to have that same sense of loneliness and things like that. Um, and their body is going to break down. But one thing that I actually just thought about in talking with you guys about it is the idea that the new clone knows more about what's going on than the old clone do you think that that's because the old clone is shutting down and a side effect of that is like memory loss? This idea that like the old clone knew everything that the new clone clone knew at one point, but his body is deteriorating and his like mental facilities are breaking down. So he just kind of forgets a lot of things. Yeah. That's, I think that might be, yeah. Now that you bring it up, I think, yeah, I think the point that, like you said, yeah, exactly. Like if he, if he was breaking down, he's, his brain is literally shutting down. So he kind of, starting to forget things and he's starting to see things and the new clone is more fresh and new and he's very well aware of everything and he kind of 
can like analyze the situation. It's like, this guy's dying. Why is he dying? No, and just things like that. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good point that you bring up. Yeah, I think one scene that kind of reinforces that is when he's, it's one of my favorite shots in the movie, a piece of dialogue that I only really picked up on on a rewatch was when he's working on the model of the uh, the village and whatnot. And he's working on, I don't know, like the fifth or sixth building that goes into the town. A, he doesn't know what the old clone doesn't know what town it is. And B, he even admits that he doesn't remember who built the first part of it. And so the new clone is like, you just said you don't even know who built, you don't remember building the beginning of it. And the new clone knows exactly what town it is. I don't remember what town it is, but um, which you would, reason would stem to be that it's his town from home or something like that. And it's a memory that he had, or that was implanted rather, that he has now like literally forgotten. But Berto, you mentioned the hallucination. Max, what did you think of kind of showing or the hallucinations that are facilitating like his memory degrading and his kind of like mental stability shaking? What did you think of those? Because there's only a few moments in the movie, but they're pretty uh, pretty pivotal to the plot. I didn't know who the person who's hallucinating was. Um, I there, There's a theory. It's totally... It's, unrelated to movies but or i guess it is kind of related to movies that memories can be passed down they're like genetic memories um and so for instance you know it was a a young brunette woman sitting in the chair and then another young brunette woman sitting uh, outside of his uh rv uh i think that may have been his daughter um depending on how old she was like when they took the original Sam's genetic sample, you know, maybe this memory of his daughter has, you know, implanted on him to the, to the point of being able to pass down, um, you know, through his clones or whatever, but that's kind of a really far reaching theory. Uh, <laughs> I would agree frank- with that. No, yeah. You know, frankly, I, I couldn't, I didn't know who the whole assassination was. Um, his daughter was my next best guess. Yeah, that's what that's what I would have thought too. I feel like it was definitely some re- like someone close to him, and like Max said, it kind of got passed down. And I feel like the idea probably evolved as it gets passed down. So it's like someone completely different because it doesn't look nothing like his daughter when he finds the video of her. So it's like maybe an idea that it might be someone really close to him, but at the same time, because it got passed down from so many clones, that kind of the idea dies down. It di- gets diluted to some different related to it, but different. Right. So, the original concept. so I believe that it's his daughter and this is kind of like doing little snippets of the math that they introduce in the movie. In the first video recording that we see of his wife and his daughter, I believe she's supposed to be three years old. And if he is the, which clone is he now? I think he it, it says it's about 15 years. Yeah. It's been like 15 years. So she should be 18 essentially. So somehow like that's a memory that was, not supposed to probably get passed down from the original Sam since the original Sam has obviously seen her when she's 18 years old. Cause he's back on earth. And somehow that memory must have gotten sent genetically like Max had said. So that way he kind of is able to visualize her in the future. But yeah, I mean, I assume that the clone that the uh, hallucination he sees is his daughter. Um, but I don't know for me, I wanted more scenes like that. I wanted more hallucinations. I mean, there's even that great scene where he's having a dream of when he's having sex with his wife and then it cuts to like under the sheets and we see Sam in a spacesuit, and he's like reaching out to them and he's almost like getting eaten by the bed or getting eaten by the sheets. And I wanted more scenes like that because I think the film has such a heavy emphasis on the fact that his, in addition to his body, like his memory is breaking down and his, Men, uh, mental facilities are crumbling essentially. And I kind of just wish they had gotten a little weirder with the sort of hallucinations he was seeing other than him, just like a lot of scenes of him vomiting blood or losing teeth, I guess. Did you guys think there were enough of those scenes or, or did you think there was just enough to kind of push the plot along? It allowed the plot to move forward, but I think it, it would have been a little more interesting to kind of take that creative aspect and like almost make ghosts of his past. Um, what, especially between you know the new clone and the old clone, if they, I mean, they already share memories, but if 
there was a way to like bleed memories between the two. Like they were somehow more connected than, you know, just being clones of each other. Um, but yeah, I think hallucinations, I think more time spent like on the moon itself, um, maybe him wandering around or getting lost or whatever. But as far as the story goes, I think those, um, those hallucinations help move it along. What did you think, Bert? Did you think that those did a good, a good enough job of kind of solidifying that part of the narrative? Or do you think that more inclusions of those could have kind of like expanded a little more on the different ways in which his kind of like mind is breaking down to match his body breaking down? I feel like, I feel like they could have added a little more. I wouldn't have, it would not have hurt. I feel like it would have matched. It would have more visually, we could have seen how far his brain is getting pushed and how he would have already, uh, at this point, he's already kind of like losing it. And he's basically at the end of his contract. Um, so I think I think it would have helped, like, for example, other than the scene that he sees a person standing outside of his rover or whatever, the, his little car. I think had it, had it had like a scene where like he sees like a shadow far away, it kind of would have hinted more at his mental stability is kind of degrading at that point. Or like, or like seeing someone run in the hallways or something, kind of like to show more of like, not just his physical body, but at the same time, his mental stability is kind of getting out of control. I think it would have definitely helped. And I feel like it wouldn't have taken away much of like the story itself, because it would have kind of just shown at what point he, he's at in, during the movie, where he's kind of basically at his limit right. of what he can do as a human being. Yeah. And I think that you could do those in some, you could have hallucinations in some very subtle ways that would have made some of the scenes that I think there's a point early in the movie where it's probably a 20 minute span where it's just him going through his routine and nothing really suspicious is happening. But for me, that's probably the low point in the movie just because it's so regimented and it's just showing him doing these kind of like very basic and simplistic activities. And I wanted a little bit more to actually happen to kind of like get into the fact that his body's breaking down along with his mind earlier on. So I think that if they had it, like the scene where he's watering his plants and stuff like that. I wish that we had had a little more, couple more hallucination scenes that could serve as for like of a lack of a better word, like scares or something like that. Um, but Berto, what did you think of Gertie and Gertie is like the big robot that's voiced by Kevin Spacey. Um, what did you think of the use of that character? And do you think that it, they used it enough early on? I think I, I like the fact that, Gertie is like a machine, but he's not an evil machine. He's kind of trying to help him out. At the same time, he has like dark secrets where he's actually talking to people on earth. So it's like, but he's not really kind of, he's not really trying to manipulate Sam to do in some, uh, like he's just trying to keep his own, like he kind of like keeps his own secrets. Um, I kind of like the fact that he was in there, that they, they introduced this uh, machine robot as another being because it kind of helped out kind of keep his mind stable in a sense because he kind of has someone to talk to but the the way the fact that it helped along to keep doing his job that's what really i think kind of helped the move the movie keep going because he was kind of basically helping him oh he's like oh i have i found something outside like i need to go and at one point he has to like kind of talk his way out of it like he needs to like basically negotiate or like he tricks him into letting him out to go check out what's in the rover or like what he found and it's like there's certain like points where Gertie does keep him like trying to keep him inside the ship or the spaceship or the station but at the same time if it's to me it came off as being very helpful and not an evil thing that's trying to kill him yeah it's a complicated relationship right because like you said at the beginning of the movie Gertie is very secretive in a lot of ways like Mm -hmm. we see there's that live transmission that Gertie's having with earth essentially who are like the executives of whoever the company is that's in charge of everything But then later on in the movie, he helps him to escape. And there's a lot of flip-flopping there that I don't think is really explained that well. Like Gertie at one point, like he, Sam Rockwell even asks him at one point, he's like, why are you helping me? And Gertie's like, I'm here to help you, that kind of thing. But this idea then that like, why were you being so secretive and to a certain extent manipulative at the beginning of the movie? Did that, uh, did that ever occur to you, Max? Kind of just the complicated kind of relationship and which side Gertie was actually on? Was he on team clone or was he on team corporation? I think he was, I, I think he's more of a, a, a mediator between the two um, because he's there to make sure that Sam doesn't, I guess Sam doesn't die early, but I, I guess 
really wouldn't matter if they just, you know, woke up another clone. Um, but I think Gertie's there to facilitate Sam's day-to-day activities and make sure he stays in line with the corporate um, game plan. However, I feel like Gertie, Gertie follows his programming. He's programmed to help Sam regardless. Um, and so that, that did pose a few questions for me, like how many has this happened before? Um, did some clone become self-aware or, uh, you know, has this, this situation happened where two clones met each other? Cause, um, I feel like it could uh, 15 years, you know, nothing goes smoothly for 15 years, obviously. So, you know, th- there's that, there's that one, but, you know, on the other hand, let's say the clones did not become self-aware the corporation could not program even if gertie is a high is ai and high intelligent ai um you would have to program that response of a clone asking that question you know i don't think they anticipated that at any point the clone is going to be able to figure out that he's a clone uh so the fact that he asked gertie and my clone you know gertie's trying to be helpful and say yes you are he does dodge the question a little bit, but, you know, at first it feels like he's dodging the question, but I don't know if Sam just did not, um, he wasn't specific enough to, you know, warrant that answer. It's like putting, you know, you're looking for an answer on Google. Uh, if you put the question in wrong, you're not going to get the right answer. So and I think that's what, I don't think Gertie specifically had a side, um, but he was there to help. You know, I don't think he was hurt, helping or hurting. And I appreciated Gertie not being like every other um, base AI, you know, because I thought about, um, you know, obviously 2001 Space Odyssey with Hal, thought about um, even Wally. Um, I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the, the ship, yeah. you know, autopilot and the, the computer constantly tries to keep the human beings in check. Well, this one is just, yeah, I'm here to help. I'm here to ke- help you keep you alive. Um, if you want to leave, that's fine. We're just going to wake one, <laughs> wake someone else up. So, you know, I don't know, you know, basically a neutral character, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a mediator. It, it, it helps move the story along, but it doesn't provide any conflict because there's plenty of conflict there already. Yeah. The thing that really solidifies it for me that he is, that Gertie is a neutral character is when uh, the old Sam Rockwell clone like he, he can't even remember his password to log in. And then you see the little arm come up and like punch in the password for him. And in that instance, it's not viewed as helping him escape. It's just viewed as helping. And when Gertie mm. says, Hey, I'm just here to help. That scene is indicative of that. Like he has no feelings either way of what the clone is doing. It's just the clone needs help. And he is clearly fucking up his duties. So I need to come help him with that. Um, I thought, I thought it was interesting that, Kevin Spacey only agreed to do the lines after they had finished making the movie. So he like came in afterwards and did all the lines, which I thought was strange. I would have thought that it would have, I guess since he's playing a robot, he doesn't have to play off of anybody. So it makes sense that he would just kind of like show up when the movie's done and then like take a day and a half to record his lines or half a day. Um, What did you guys think though of like having a notable actor play the AI voice? Berto, what did you think of that? Because my thing would be like, if you're going to have a character that doesn't have a massive role in the movie, does it really matter if it's Kevin Spacey's voice or if it's somebody else? Do you have any thoughts on that? I feel like his voice is very fitting for a robot. Mm-hmm. That's what I noticed. Like, it's like, I don't know, just the way he like lowers his voice, like the tone that he says things is very robotic like, and I feel like it fits so well because Grady, it, Grady is it's like a robot. It's like a legit robot. It doesn't have any emotion. Mm-hmm. Like I think this is the most robotic thing that at least I've seen in movies where there's no emotion into it. Because like he doesn't want to kill um, Sam. He doesn't. He also is not really like he's just doing his job and it's very robotic. And I feel like the voice is very fitting for that. Like I, I don't know. I, I really like the fact that his voice. It's very it fits it fits with the character. I mean, the Gertie's operating system or program or whatever is so out of date. Like you can see the fifteen years that have spanned since that base was built, yeah. and that 
Gertie has not been ma- uh, had any maintenance done and stuff. And like, you can't even hear certain inflections in its voice. Obviously it's a program, but instead of using like emotional responses to things, it just uses the pictures, right? Of the smiley of yeah. the face. And it's either a smiley face or it's like a confused face or it's a crying face. And I think that kind of speaks to just the overall movie and the kind of tone of the movie and just being like very unforgiving. Like the old clone figures out he's in a shitty situation and there's almost nothing he can do about it. And it's like, right. he doesn't really have it. The one ally that he has, it's like, how much can this new ally do for me? It's more about what I can do for him before I have to kind of like cash my chips out essentially. So something that I really liked about Moon that I think helps kind of nail its overall aesthetic that makes it a little different than traditional sci-fi movies is it's kind of near future setting where it's, I think it takes place in the 2030s, which now obviously is not that far away, but it takes place in a far away enough point in the future that it's seeable, right? Like you could see something like this happening where, yeah, they develop a base, they get technology that they can develop a base on the moon. It's not so unbelievable, right? It's not kind of like a Star Trek or a Star Wars sense of the future where it's things that we wouldn't see for like another 600, 700 years in terms of like a technology advancement. But in terms of the overall special effects, I was surprised to learn that a majority of the movie was like practical effects. Like I thought that a majority of it was CGI, but everything that was kind of the outdoor set was apparently models, which I didn't realize, um, which I think is cool because it kind of lends, as I said, the movie is not like Star Trek and Star Wars, but those movies were very heavily made with models. So I think that kind of like reverting back to a practical sense is a great feature of the film. What did you guys, what did you think, Berto, of the... uh, overall kind of just like space setting. Yeah, I, I liked it. I thought it was a more, like you said, like it was more of a realistic thing, not as much of like a Star Trek, Star Wars kind of feel. Like it felt like something that you could actually like see if you were to go on space kind of thing. Like, you know, they've already set up their own station up there and I, everything seemed felt, at least it felt to me realistic in the sense like, yeah, they have like self-driven robots, but like, obviously if you have, I feel like if you have enough a technology to set a station on the moon, you have enough technology to have a self-driven robot. So it, to me, it felt really realistic in that sense. So I, that's, I, that also, I think helps a lot with the movie for me. It makes it kind of sells it to me more to the sense of like feeling more realistic and not so sci-fi ish at least. Um, but yeah, I thought it was, it was great. It really helped. Um, some of the scenes, I mean, you can kind of tell, like obviously they're in the moon in the background, I'm assuming it's all CGI, but um, you can kind of, it's kind of not the best CGI, but I mean, it's for me, it was good enough to the point where I didn't have an issue with it at all. How about you, Max? Did you think that this, the the emphasis on kind of practical effects and a sense of it being a near distant future hurt or helped it rather than it being set three or 400 years in the future? I think the, I'm surprised that it was practical effects too, um, especially on those shots where um, it's the, you know, the harvesters. I thought that was CGI. Um, also, when the rover is going across the surface, uh, I thought, you know, and any scene out, outside of the base, I, I thought was CGI. Um, and it's super clean. Because uh, when I think of practical effects, especially on a um, space movie, for whatever reason, I go straight to Star Wars, which is almost 100% special effects, or uh, practical effects and puppets and I mean, you can tell they're puppets here. I didn't, you know, I didn't realize that first. So um, I felt it, it made it a little more realistic and, and a little more um, unsettling, I would guess, because it seems like something that could happen in our lifetime, you know, but like something like Prometheus or Alien or something, um, I couldn't connect. Yeah, it'd be scary to have the xenomorphs come, but it'd be more terrifying to figure out that a corporation is using clone slaves on the moon, um, you know, politically and economically that that's, I guess, I guess that was an adult <laughs> that's scary to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, I, I felt it helped and I, I felt it kept it um, fairly grounded and, and realistic. There wasn't any, super crazy technology that I couldn't see myself using. I mean, I guess Gertie is 
a, you know, a, a more advanced version of Alexa. I mean, you see kind of these preliminary technologies that we have here, um, like smart homes and, you know, whatever voice activated devices. And even the harvester look like um, a modern day combine um, that they used to harvest, you know, for industrial farms. Yeah. And I think that having such a small scale sense of effects, if there had been a lot of CGI in the movie, it might have detracted from this being a very central narrative wrapped around an individual, right? It's about this individual trying to uncover the mystery of the moon and what's happening to him, both physically and mentally. And placing an emphasis on CGI and having more effects every moments, I think, would kind of distract from the intention of the movie, right? So if we had a big action set piece unfold out on the moon or like you had the rescue team come and he had to like avoid them throughout the entire movie or something like that. I think that kind of takes away from this character focus and character study of the character. But uh, I mean, I'm surprised how good the movie looks considering it had a $5 million budget, which is insane to me. Cause like you said, Max, this is such a polished looking movie that, I mean, some of the planet CGI, I guess that they used wasn't the cleanest, but overall the entire movie and the atmosphere, I think, really captures kind of the isolating and uh, rather suffocating nature of what it would be like to be the only person, uh, obviously you don't know about the clones, but the only person on this moon. And to your point about like Gertie, Gertie is an extrapolation of technology we already have. So it's never like a hologram is walking around the ship, following him where he goes and things like that. It's on tracks that are on the ceiling. So like there's a lot of limitations in that technology. And again, I think those limitations, like Berto said, really helps to make you feel like you could be there, which essentially makes it more terrifying because you can put yourself in his shoes and be like, this is what it could really be like. The only, if he was in this base and the base was actually on earth versus the moon, you wouldn't know just because of like the way that the technology is so restrictive or relatable. You have like points of reference for those things. Um, and in kind of just, Again, talking about the overall atmosphere, what did you guys think of the score, which was uh, composed by Clint Marshall? Max, what did you think about that? I guess he did a good job because I didn't really notice the music specifically. Um, it blended really well with the atmosphere and really well with um, the flow and pace of the movie. I think part, part of me feels that if you know this, a movie composer does his job if you don't know that the music's really there. Um, if it, it's not very bl blaring, I thought it was fairly subtle and, and well done. Yeah, it kind of captures the loneliness, again, of being, it complements the overall aesthetic of the movie, and it captures kind of like the muted color palettes. It, it captures just the loneliness aspect, the depression aspect of you have like an, a, an Alexa to talk to, and that's it for three years. Um, Berto, what did you think? Because you and I were watching it the other night and we were talking about kind of the ways in which it matches the ebb and flow of emotions in the movie. A long line with what Max was saying, I think they did a great job at that because it's very, very minimal note. Like you can barely tell that there's music going on just because I feel like you get caught up on what's going on in the movie and it kind of, it kind of fits so perfectly with the, um, with the movie itself and like what's, what's going on in the screen that you kind of lose a sense of like the music and you're kind of just in the zone it kind of they both work together really well with just kind of keeping you focused and keeping you moving on but um overall i thought it was it was great i think it definitely adds more to the scenes of like the intensity and like the the very subtle quietness tones to it that really help you feel like you're in space where there's no sound there's no sound wave so it's very minimal noises that you will hear from it yeah absolutely and i think again if you don't have all of these different parts and establishing the world. I don't know how well the film works overall, right? Because I think Sam Rockwell does a great job and it's cool to see him play two different versions of the same character, essentially the new and the old clone. Um, but in terms of just like nailing that atmosphere, if they don't nail that atmosphere, there's almost no point in having the movie set on the moon, right? Because it's like, oh, why isn't he just on earth in the desert somewhere doing something similar or whatnot? So I really think it, it surprised me on a rewatch how strong that atmosphere and that tone are considering this is Duncan Jones's first film, which the more I think about that and the more I say that like is insane to me considering there's 
so little like stumbling in terms of the pacing of a story that is very unique, I think, in terms of just like sci-fi movies. Like Max was saying, there was a comparison to Aliens that I think he threw out there uh, earlier. And it's like, how many movies do we see where the plot point is like, oh, the alien shows up or this or that, which we're very used to. And in this to kind of have this be almost like a capitalist nightmare where we see what capitalism does when it moves to space. And they're like all of the new types of uh, human violations or not human, but clones, but just like violations of the human condition kind of thing where it's like creating a new disposable workforce, I think is a really kind of like morose topic to tackle in space. And it's done so in a really unique way. But uh, were there any other kind of scenes that we skipped over that somebody wanted to highlight? I think that's those scenes after the fight, like leading up to the fight and then after the fight, uh, I think were interesting because, you know, when Sam plays both of these parts, he's, you know, the the old clone um, is looking at the new clone and he's like, yeah, I, like, I know, I know everything. I already know everything about you. And he's kind of looking at the new clone as, um, like you're going to learn, you know, like, like almost like a mentor or whatever. And like, yeah, I have a temper. And he's like, yeah, I know you have a temper, but, and he's sitting there and he's teaching and guiding him on how to, you know, use the knife when he's cutting out the model or, you know, doing the plants or whatever small tasks are around. He's like, you're not going to want to do it that way. You're going to want to do it this way. And you can kind of see that juxtaposition of, of growth between the two. Um, but as I want to ask, do you think it, it would have, this, this is not related to the story, I guess, but do you think it would have benefited the company to have clones interact with each other to teach them to pass on various knowledge? Or do you think that they would have run into a situation where the clones are like, you know, I want to quote unquote go home. You know, why'd you trap me here? You know, kind of a bird in a cage or, or a science experiment gone wrong type of thing. I think I think if if they keep if they kept it a secret like they did, they would have ran into this mess of like, why are you hiding this from us kind of thing. I felt like if you just put it out there and kind of let them know like you guys are here to do this and that, yeah, they probably would have re rebelled. Maybe some of them would have, but since they're all alike in a sense, like they have the same thought process, so you probably want to find someone. You want to clone someone that has like a kind of like worker's thought process in that sense, like. You don't want to hire like someone that's like wants to be free and go and about like you want to hire someone that is likes to take orders and likes to be structured process i guess i feel like but in the sense like if they just kept it hidden secret like they did in the movie it would have kind of it kind of just it would evolve into this huge problem which what the what the movie is all about and i think had they just let them know like listen or, or put at least five clones as long as the personality of the clone is like a worker's in the in the worker's mind frame, like kind of like they're here to work and they know they're here to work and this is their job, I feel like they would have ran into less trouble than had they did what they did in the movie. Yeah, so I'm kind of conflicted on it because I think the idea that there's too much, it's a recipe for disaster essentially. If you have two identical clones, you would have them both freak out and trying to get to the bottom of that. Like, I don't see how you can, or get to the bottom of like the mystery of why are there clones there because then they realize we're descendants from somebody and they both realize our contract is up at three years and whatnot. And so I think nine times out of 10, they try to escape, which is counterproductive to what the company wants. But maybe the idea of them having two people that have been cloned. And so it's two opposite people. So if you have a clone from one guy and a clone from another guy, obviously they're not going to have this kind of like introspective nightmare or whatever, where they're like, why is there a doppelganger of myself? And it might be more normal. And so if they're more complacent because they have companionship now in space, they might be able to operate smoother or whatnot, something to that effect. But at the same time, like the very kind of like capitalist corporation mentality is, is that you don't want your workers to, for lack of a better term, like unionize. You don't want the two of them get putting their heads together and being like, hey, some things aren't adding up. We should try to escape. So I don't know if there really is a solution for this and it kind of just shows like the lack of foresight in the company being like hey we found a solution to our problem but in reality there is no solution really because we see how it all un unravels and the like it was a short-term solution then because apparently the movie is only it's like 15 years worth of clones right or 
whatever that amount of time has passed. So sure, they had profits for 15 years, but now as we learn when he returns to earth, we catch that uh, brief news bulletin. And we hear in the news bulletin, like the corporation now has to answer all these uncomfortable questions about their practices on the moon, which uh, actually that's funny. It bleeds into one of Duncan Jones's other movies. Did you guys ever see Mute? It's another sci-fi movie that it takes place in the same universe as Moon, but it doesn't have anything to do with the plot of Moon. Um, is that the one with uh, Paul? Um, is that the one those on yeah, Netflix? So with, Paul, uh, yeah, it has it? Paul Rudd. Um, it has uh, Alexander Skarsgård in it where he plays like, he plays a mute guy that his girlfriend goes missing. It's honestly, it's not a very good movie, but there's a scene <laughs> in it where he's in a cafe and a TV is on and he catches a news bulletin. And the news bulletin is all about uh, Sam Rockwell's character from Moon. And he goes to like court and he's suing the company. And you look in the background and there's like 30 other clones of him that have escaped from the facility that are all like suing this company. Oh, that's pretty Which is pretty funny. Um, I like that little cameo and that idea that like the movies take place in the same universe. But I Mm. mean, it's unfortunate that Mute was such a piece of shit, but... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm not afraid to mince words about that because that's one of those movies that has such a fantastic trailer. And then you get 45 yeah. minutes in the movie and you're like, there's another hour and 15 minutes of this and it's just going nowhere. Um, yeah. But one other thing that I read in the commentary for Moon, the director's commentary that I thought was interesting. You remember when he's trying to escape in the escape pod and he's putting one of those uh, tubes into the escape pod? That mm-hmm. apparently mm-hmm. is filled with the resource that they've been mining from the moon. And they claim mm-hmm. that it's worth like $15 million. And so this idea that he wanted that so that he could kind of escape and have enough money to live for the next three years, I thought was a cool little detail, but they, uh, for whatever reason, decided to kind of cut that out. And I think the, the only, the last note or uh, fun fact I had about the movie was Duncan Jones's father is David Bowie, which what? which doesn't have anything to do with Moon, but I just learned that and I thought it was worth mentioning. That's yeah. interesting. Oh, that's it. <laughs> was very random to realize. Yeah, I gotta say though that that scene where he's kind of going into the like he's getting on the ship, the escape pod, and like he's getting literally yeah he's escaping. That felt so claustrophobic. Oh, yeah. I just felt so like sick. Like he was literally stuck in this tiny thing. It's like the ship was shaking the whole time. I felt like I was going to throw yeah. up for him. Jesus. Yeah. I just felt yeah. very, and ugh. For, for three days, he said. And, you know, I'm glad. Oh, my God. I'm glad the director was very selective in his exposition mm-hmm. and his time that he, you know, in the scenes that he selected. Because if, if they, you know, spent any more time of him in that capsule, I think it would have completely detracted from um you know the original sam you know the Mm -hmm. the i guess the military the security team Mm -hmm. coming in to you know find the original sam and reset you know reset this whole process um so i would say i really appreciated the the director's um finesse with with the exhibition and the narrative because even those jay you mentioned earlier that those 20 minutes when they're going when he's going through his routine um i felt help build that sense of repetition and um sense of this guy's been doing the same thing every day for three years and it's monotonous and it's you know driving him insane um but yeah i think i'm I'm glad he they didn't spend any time in that capsule outside for that you know maybe minute where he's cheering and and happy yeah i think the monotony that you mentioned and i was a little down on that montage of his like normal day-to-day life early on but now that you mention it like it really does establish the idea that this event that occurs where he finds another person essentially is like and his whole body breaking down is very drastic and very sudden in terms of just how disruptive it is to his normal day of life and that time is important, I suppose, and I, in uh, after hearing you say that, in just establishing how routine everything is, how mundane this contract is, and the idea that this one event that happens, even if it's not a big kind of explosive moment, again, it's very drastically different to his day-to-day life. And I think that event helps him to realize or help the viewer realize that like he has no reason to be suspicious 
for the past two and a half years or whatever. Like this has just been his life and it's very kind of like clean cut and straightforward and nothing has ever arisen before that makes him question kind of the validity of his reality. But uh, yeah, this I think I was glad that you picked Moon. It was a movie that uh, I was looking forward to picking up and revisiting because it's one that, like I said, I, I don't think I'd seen it since it came out back in 2009, but uh, it definitely holds up as a really impressive directorial debut, but also a really original kind of just sci-fi premise in, uh, premise in general, which appreciative of. So I appreciate you guys coming on today to chat about it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks, man. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to Daily Horror Habit on your preferred streaming service and follow at Daily Horror Habit on Instagram and at Daily Horror Pod on Twitter.